this was uh, knowledge or information that came to me from Loyola, I began my last post by saying that Tennessee Williams was one of my favorite poets. And he certainly is, um, along with Flannery O'Connor. Both Flannery O'Connor and Tennessee Williams are the kind of poets that you have to return to if you want to constitute what the South in the past was and what the relations were among uh, the various groups of people in the South. And so poets, for this reason, poets are essential to historians. You can't do a history, you know, you cannot do a history that is uh, adequate if you do not listen to the voices of those who listen to the voices of, you see? Because a northern, a northern writer today cannot capture what the world of the South was like. And a southern writer cannot capture what the world of the northeastern part of the United States is like as well. I can't, I'm, I would never say that a northern writer um, could not write a history of the South. But I would say that if that writer did not pay attention to what great poets said about it, because poets listen, with, they are good listeners, and they put in their verbs and in their nouns and in their adjectives and in their clauses, they put the way of speaking of a people, they put the character of life of those people out west in the United States or down south or up north, you know, they, they, they capture that. And if you doubt it, if anybody doubts it, um, you know, I have, uh, I had made the, I had made the, um, it's not an assumption, it was just a, an experience I had of the woman that I call the debutante, that maybe she's a southern woman, but I wasn't certain of that. But it, it kind of, for me, it came through in the way I saw her interacting with her friends. There was a deeper, there was a deeper level of relating to the others that, what, that bespoke that kind of, that kind of thing. And it is experienced by some people um, as a difference in the way Northerners and Southerners are. And um, Madison struck me as the more cosmopolitan, the more city type, like the more city type person in the debutante as the more rural, the more, um, the more nostalgic uh, type. Whereas Madison, the more forward-looking, the more modern type, the, the, the person who looks forward to that modern future as opposed to that type of person who looks more back toward the, um, more back toward a Victorian past, for instance. Now, those are just, you know, those might very well be erroneous conceptions. It could be that they're both from large cities in the north. Um, it could be that they're both from, from the south. It could be that, you know, that, that that's not, that isn't the truth. But I think that when you do a poem or you do verse or you try to do a novel or something like that, you try to capture a sense of the person or of the persons involved that you're writing about. And that can be a very important thing. I remember a long time ago on uh, Beloit College campus meeting a guy named Knox. And he was from Tennessee, actually. And, you know, when he would speak, he had a very, uh, it was a very obvious <laughs> Southern accent. And, you know, he would describe his life in the South at parties that I would, had gone to on Beloit's campus. And I met a great diversity of students there in the past and um, a, as I mentioned another guy named Josh who came from the north and his parents were northern intellectuals and so if you put Josh at a party together with Knox like you couldn't bring two, two more um, 
different people together, but you know they would have both had an enormously good time. Um, my friend Jeff Hansen, who some people may have looked into, Jeff Hansen, class of eight, 1985, and he wrote a book about Beloit. And I haven't read that for my research for the novel yet, but I'm going to read his book on Beloit because once he graduated from Beloit, he ended up working in Beloit for a while. And then he wrote a book about Beloit, and then it was a couple years after he graduated, 85, 6, 7, let's see, 86. It was a year after he graduated. He wrote the book after the year after he graduated, and then I was finishing the Chicago Marathon. And I had finished the Chicago Marathon on this day, um, and I was walking down the street in Chicago after I finished running the marathon, and Jeff Hansen was coming down the street, and he's like, hey, you were Maria's boyfriend at Beloit. I haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? And um, then he told me at that point, he said, I wrote a book about Beloit. He's like, I... I yeah, it was like one of the things that he was like in a hurry, so he had to get going, and I had to go back to Rockford. But I had just finished the Chicago Marathon, and he was like, hey, I, I wrote a book about Beloit. You know, that's what I've been doing for the last year. He used to tell me when I'd go and visit him at Beloit College, he would tell me about his summers, where he worked in the he worked in Wisconsin in these pickle vats, these like huge pickle vats. I mean, you can't even imagine the size of, the, like if you... Um, thousands uh, upon thousands of gallons of pickle brine you could put he could he'd stand in one of those things and it was like eight times his height you know that's how huge it was and he would scrub those pickle vats and that was his job over the summer that he would do to work to get money to supplement his college uh his college at, at uh funding at Beloit and so I met some really excellent people at Beloit College and I became convinced over the years and reflecting on it that they got they got the best education that they could have gotten and um, I can't say that I regret having gone to Beloit College or I mean to um, Loyola University but I but I do kind of think now that I look back on it I'm like man I should have gone to Beloit College you know, but I don't, I, Blake College standards were a little bit, it was a little bit more difficult to get accepted there than to get accepted at Loyola University, and I never applied at Blake College, and I somewhat regret that now, that I should have applied to Beloit and to Loyola. Loyola was one of the first schools, a good school that I applied to and got accepted to, and so I was very happy to be accepted at, at um, Loyola. But I think if I did it all over again, I would have applied also to Beloit because my ex-girlfriend at that time, my girlfriend at that time, ex-girlfriend today, uh, studied classics. Archaeology there was her, her primary degree was archaeology, and she had a minor in classic studies. And she really liked everything that she did. But one of the things that I brought up was this little tension that she had with Linda and how she would, she, and now she, this wasn't just a little, this wasn't, this was not something of minor importance to her. She would keep me awake at night. I'd go there to party with her on the weekends and then after parties she would keep me awake at night telling me how much this, this girl Linda had actually vexed her and hexed her, you know? And so some nights I'd end up s sitting up with her and I would talk to her, you know, trying to calm her down about this. And I would sometimes think, wow, how many hours have we, had I spent trying to make her feel good about this fact, you know, that there was really no problem and that it, whatever she endured was over. And, um, but it, she, she had to be reassured about that. But And that's why I threw that out there because Beloit seems in other ways so... All my experiences there were felicitous and harmonious, except for this fact, you know. And um, and so I brought it up because it's the dy the dynamism of that polarity comes out in my novel. But it, but I give it a re I reinterpret it in a um, in a way that draws Madison over the 25 or so years up to leading up to the reunion after their graduation and. 
anticipated graduation in 2016. I bring it out as an elemental force that is like coming into their minds as they remember the experiences they had at Folk and Blues. Now, how did some people would say, well, you did that just because that was important to you and that was important to Maria, that won't necessarily be important to them. And that's true, but I did it because it was so important to Maria and her experiences of it were of folk and blues were so strong that even to this day, if I go over and speak to her and sit with her in an afternoon and have a conversation with her, she'll bring those events up. And so that's how I reconstructed it to be also of a powerful influence on the minds of Madison X and the debutante so that people don't say I'm radically falsifying it, that it is definitely something. I took it from the experience of the individuals involved, not from my own like desiring to put to overemphasize the importance of something. I put it in the context of all the things that could be important there. Um, the other aspect that I was bringing up was that Tennessee Williams actually did visit Loyola University, and it was rumored that Tennessee Williams showed up at 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 Loyola, my alma mater, Loyola University, one time in the seventies, and this was toward the end of Tennessee Williams' life, and he was so intoxicated that he couldn't even speak to the students there. And I wondered, like, because I had read his plays and I had seen how, what a powerful poet he was and what a great person he was. And I wondered what caused his life to have that kind of tragic, that tragicness or whatever it was that had driven him to be a drinker like that. But I noted that one of my professors, a fine Shakespeare scholar, he also had his he also had his blues, if you will, because um, at each night it was rumored that he would go out to the bar down on Sheridan, and he would he would drink there, and because he was a great Shakespeare scholar and you know a poet, I know the way he spoke, you know to this day I could I could actually revive from among all my things if I still had it cassette where I, I listened to him lecture on Nietzsche's birth of tragedy in one of our classes in, in our, in our uh, tragedy course that I took and anybody who heard that tape would I think be very impressed at how he presented the ideas of Nietzsche and I was very impressed so impressed that I recorded him at that time whether or not he knew that I don't know you know, but I preserved it, and it's on a little cassette that I have, micro cassette that I have to this day, a lecture that he gave on Nietzsche's birth of tragedy. And I always, I always, um, I treasured that, that article of mine, which may still be among my things. But even if it isn't, you know, I want Loyola, the Loyola community, to know that people like Richard Shelley Hardigan and Bernard McElroy have not been forgotten. And there was a guy back there in the 80s who read the entire 600-page dissertation of Bernard McElroy with that quotation from, um, from Niels Bohr on complementarity and that quotation epigram, the two epigrams, one from uh, King Lear, you know, that we have to endure going hence even while we endure going hither. You know, we have to be pulled in one direction in life even while we're pulled in another direction. We have to be flexible. We have to realize that life is about change. And it's about also about um, stability, uh, as the Play King Lear is that I recommend to everyone.